ladies and gentlemen. It's time for the last session of uh, the scientific work workshop. Uh, we are talk about uh, several uh, subjects, and uh, now it's time to uh, start with the fourth session about uh, integration of robots uh, in farms. And uh, as a key word in uh, robotics for agriculture is adaptability, and since uh, ARM is uh, unfortunately uh, ill and cannot join us, uh, we will skip the first keynote and we will rearrange uh, the session and we will uh, start right now uh, with, sorry, Mark Matko, sorry, uh, from the University of Zagreb. Uh, we will talk about Specular Ha, so toward fully autonomous robotic farming system. So please go ahead and welcome to. Okay, uh, first of all, thank you for having me here. And it's been delighted seeing all the robots around and, and getting a glimpse of the demos tomorrow. Uh, my name is Matko Orsag. I come from the University of Zagreb and I'll be talking about a project we call Specularia on behalf of my PhD students uh, listed here. So I, as I said, I come from the University of Zagreb and we are a laboratory for robotics and intelligent control systems. Uh, that means that we mainly work and deal with robots. We love robots. We love to put them under um, extreme conditions, and agriculture is definitely one of them. Um, so I will show you a little bit of uh, the project that we're doing. Um, first, just maybe to kick off before we start with uh, the main topic, a uh, couple of projects, Hector and Watchplant, these projects, uh, they work mostly on agriculture robotics that you can see here. So basically robots uh, in the field uh, working in viticulture and mariculture, which is the Hector project. Um, Croatia is a coastline country and our vineyards are mostly uh, focused on, on the coastline. It's very steep, it's close to the waters. So we're building a heterogeneous system that kind of tries to um, mitigate both worlds and to work both in mariculture and viticulture. Uh, Watchplant is another interesting project, maybe focus more on IoT and AI. But basically, uh, this is a future emerging technologies uh, Horizon 2020 project uh, where we are working on putting sensors on plants to build uh, bio hybrid systems uh, and let actually plants tell us the condition of the surrounding air. So basically, we're not testing the air quality, we're asking plants to tell us what the air quality is. But the main topic of my talk will be the Specularia project, which is focused about, uh, around greenhouse uh, robotics, so robots working in the greenhouse. The main idea is to harness heterogeneous robots, so different types of robots not building huge machines, relying on small machines and seeing how we can put them together to make them uh, work in a collaborative manner and achieve uh, farming skills. So uh, as we move from conventional robotics, uh, we usually, when we think about robotics in industry, we think about uh, these kind of applications where uh, we have huge factories, uh, we have a lot of safety issues that we talked about in the previous panel. So uh, bringing humans in contact with these huge machines, it's, uh, it's not a good idea. And factories today really try to avoid that. But there are certain tasks, and I would argue that farming is, involves these tasks, that are very hard to program the machine to do. So we turn to something that we call collaborative robotics. Basically, uh, this is a set of skills, soft components, compliant behavior, impedance control algorithms, and programming by demonstration. Here you can see one application in actually Airbus factory where, um, where there was, the idea was to uh, finish the inner parts of the aircraft, something that's been, that's been done manually for ages right now, and it's really hard to completely automate, automize it because once you have a machine do it and you put it uh, under human test, a human eye to test, it's very easy to see specific patterns that machines do. And uh, if, if we tell the human operator to teach the robot how to do it, 
then it's easier to do it. However, the human operators are usually not programmers. They're not skilled enough to program the robot to do it. So we, but we can actually teach the robot by just showing the robot how to do it. And basically, we want to apply the same concept in farming. So we want farmers to have uh, simple machines that they can teach how to do. They can teach them how to diagnose certain diseases. They can teach them how to apply certain uh, skills on the, on the plant. But in order to be able to do that, we need to provide some kind of structure in the environment. So uh, in this project, we're proposing to have, uh, let's say, a shed, a robotic shed, where we can bring the plants to. It's a structured environment with the structured lighting conditions that enable us to execute certain algorithms. And then we bring, bring plants to, to robots. So we're actually not uh, building robots around plants. We are growing plants around robots. So uh, by using this hypothesis, we start uh, by simple tasks of pepper picking, which is uh, something that's already been done and in, in various ways. But uh, having a structured environment allows us to do it uh, very quickly, for a farmer to teach the robot to do it quickly. So here in this example, we actually used only 3D models that you can see on the bottom left screen to teach the robot how to harness, harvest uh, actual pepper plants. So the robot has never seen an actual pepper uh, plant. It, it, can, it only saw a 3D model of it made in, in Blender in this case. Um, we, would, we took a bunch of uh, images of pepper plants. We, we built uh, thousands and thousands of images from these 3D models. And we, uh, we programmed a simple AI to detect and find peppers. And it was uh, actually very easy to complete. But of course, I would argue if we want to be uh, robot farmers, then we need to have a very versatile set of skills that we can apply and we can do uh, agrotechnical procedures on the plant. So for instance, we want to pollinate flowers, perhaps. We want to uh, detect diseased parts and pick them uh, and cut them off. We also want to remove excess uh, fruit. So there is different uh, things that are very hard to build a machine to do it in a generalized way. So we want uh, robots that are actually able to uh, be soft and compliant when in contact with plants. So here we built uh, the robot, uh, robotic arm we call Sophia, which is a soft-like structure made from rubber. And it's able to pick up uh, and pick plants and do a lot of procedures that we're doing. But we've also tested it on certain different skills, like uh, pouring a glass of whiskey in soft robotics competition. So basically, uh, from farm to fork, uh, we can uh, farm plants, and then we can serve uh, the drinks. Um, the, the idea of this uh, construction is actually to use the soft rubber components and to combine them with hard metal structures like the hinges you see uh, on the 3D model. These are actual door hinges, small door hinges that we attach to it. So this actually allows us to be very sturdy when we pick up a bottle, but we remain uh, compliant enough to pick the smallest strawberries and the smallest peppers and, and everything in the lab that we want. Another component uh, that's also important if you want to be in contact with plants is uh, to sense where the plant are and sense how strong your touch is and actually to be nice and gentle to the plants. So uh, mechanical properties are just one example, but we also need uh, sensor skills to be able to not harm the plant. So in this, this is an example of a device uh, called TACTIP. It's actually made by one of our partners in Bristol Laboratory. Um, it's actually a soft skin structure. So you, you see on the upper left part, there is a soft skin-like structure on top. Underneath, there are white pins or pins of different color. And all the way down, you have a camera pointing up and looking at the pins as they deform when you start touching objects. And this is actually mimicking the behavior of your fingers and all the sensors that we have underneath our skin. And um, what we can do is we can teach an AI to uh, 
feel the same way humans do. So in this case, we built a simple, very simple neural network that works as an encoder and decoder. And then we take the encoder part and use the, what we call the latent space in, 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 in the middle. This is actually a set of features that allows us to describe with numbers what's happening with the skin. So instead of doing the math and modeling, we apply neural network and we get 16 numbers that tell us how displaced the object is. And then these 16 numbers, which are actually mathematical formulations that we don't know and we have never derived them, we tune them and we, we, uh, we derive another algorithm that can teach us how to touch objects, how to recognize stuff, how to recognize the amount of force we apply to objects and detect the shape of the objects. So once we have all that put together, then we can have a robotic hand grab a stem of the plant without ever seeing it. So there's no a priori knowledge about this, this plant for the robot. The robot actually has a very light grip on the plant starting from the top. And when it goes down and it starts bumping into the plant very easily and gently, it detects where the plant is and builds a construction model of how the plant looks like. So once it comes down, it grabs more tightly in firm matter, just like a human would to clean the stem all the way, stem all the way going from down up, and using the a priori knowledge, well, the knowledge gained from the first step. So first I go down, I learn the shape of the plant, then I use this shape to tell my robot how to clean, clean the plant. Uh, if, we, if we can do that, then we can do even more sensitive stuff like pollinating flowers. So this is the initial step that we did. So first, in order to be able to pollinate flowers, we need to detect them. Again, utilizing the structured environment that we are working in, we can teach the, the robot how to detect flowers here we used a little bit of a different approach. So we didn't use a lot of 3D models. We actually had a farmer pointing a strawberry flower to the robot, and then the robot would go around the flower and build a data set for itself. So basically, it was programming by demonstration, but programming artificial intelligence by demonstrating it. So you can imagine a farmer um, seeing a disease on a certain plant, on a certain leaf, it can show that to the robot and then the robot can iteratively learn how to detect these uh, diseases or, or other plants that have similar, um, similar things going on. Uh, in this experiment here, as I said, the robot never saw these, these plants here. It was, auto, it was annotated by just showing a couple of flowers and a completely different set of uh, strawberries, and then it applied that knowledge to detect strawberry flowers on completely different set of plants. And we were able to detect and touch flowers very precisely. Next, we want to build the knowledge about the plant. So, uh, as we have another experience with flying above and, and taking multispectral images of vineyards and building NDVI maps and all that. So we wanted to apply the same procedure, but in the greenhouse environment. And uh, what we learned when we wanted to apply the same cameras that we use on the UAVs on, in close image uh, recording in greenhouses, we learned that it's, it's really not that good because at, the, the, this, was, this was actually Mikasen's uh, multispectral camera. So they, they, said, they, they said that they have certain algorithms that they can help you build NDVI images from close range. But this really doesn't work very well because as you can see on the right image, the, always the cameras are displaced from each other. And the calibration that's necessary works very good for when you're taking images 50 meters above ground, but this fails when you're very close one meter or below from the plant. So it becomes inaccurate enough. So what we did is we fused it with an RGBD camera. We calibrated the system in a standard robotics approach. And this actually gave us the opportunity to record point clouds immediately from just a single image. So 
all the cameras that you see, are both the RGBD, multispectral, and blue and red cameras, they record the images at the same time. We fuse all this data, and we get point clouds in, in real time, which is actually good if you take only a couple of shots of the plan from different perspective, you can get a very dense point cloud and build all kinds of indexes that, that you would need to tell the health of the plan. Um, just looking at the plant is, is not enough. You always want IoT uh, sensors to measure the moisture around, uh, to, to measure what's happening with the plant. And uh, a lot of you probably know, but the cheap sensors that you can buy are usually not very accurate in long term. The resistive ones are probably very, very inaccurate after a couple of days of work because once they're in the ground, they, they, they tend to uh, lose their accuracy in time in contact with water. So what we want to do is we want to uh, test the plant and we want to lift the sensor up, we dry it up, and reuse it later on and recalibrate it before we go to the second plant. Um, we can clean it, we can do whatever we want with the sensor to make sure that we don't uh, transfer any diseases between, between plants. But in order to be able to do that, we need to derive a compliant control algorithm, impedance-based control algorithm, that actually enables us to go in deep, but not deep enough to uh, harm the plant, the roots. And uh, what we can do from this information is once we learn how uh, thick the soil is, how dry it is, we can use the impedance data we collected during the, the contact to actually also tell how dry the, 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 the plant is. So basically we're kind of mimicking uh, what, what's known as a steel and appearance method to detect the state of the plant. So we have both multispectral images and the feel of the soil to detect how much water the plant needs. And since our plants are constantly moving around, we can't have pipes and water them statically. We need to bring them to the robots and have them uh, water them every time that they are there. So before we can start these experiments, which, which we hope to do this uh, year, uh, we have done a bunch of simulation trying to um, actually see is this uh, economically even possible to grow food like this. And what we are trying to test beyond going if it's possible to lift off uh, big plants, assume that it's possible, but see if mobile manipulation, i.e. bringing robots close to the plants and treating plants where they grow, is faster than bringing plants toward a certain area where they, have, they are being treated. And um, we can test different configurations. We can see that if we have this kind of setup where we bring plants and move them around, we can pack the greenhouse as much as possible. And this actually uh, allows us to, to grow more food uh, on, on square meters than, than we usually could. Um, for this, we've also built a render-in-the-loop simulation environment that actually fuses a known tool in robotics called Gazebo, which uh, enables us to simulate dynamics of robots with Blender rendering software that actually renders all the images and provides realistic images when we apply artificial intelligent algorithms in the system. So we're kind of trying to cheat the system and using the best of two worlds to simulate both dynamical and imagery, uh, dynamic system and imagery of the environment. And uh, with that, I would like to conclude uh, and thank you once again for inviting me. Thank you very much. Uh, we have uh, time for uh, one or two questions. Does anybody have uh, some question? Please uh, raise hands. I'll say hello. Wait, there is a question right there. Uh, <clears throat> Sorry. Hi, thank you for your talk. Do you see any of this application uh, relevant for indoor vertical farming? Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely this is, this is relevant. 
The only problem is actually moving the plants around, but this is something that we've shown that we can do. So depending on type of fruits that we are growing and the type of plants we are treating, yes, definitely. Of course, you can't, go, you can't grow large plants, probably moving them around is not, not so easy, but yeah. Question uh, relating the NDVA, which is very, very basic uh, algorithm. If we uh, widen the nanometer scale to some other part of the bar valley uh, area, can we find out something more than the basic uh, stuff? Yeah. Um, this is actually a very good question. The algorithm that we're proposing actually allows us to measure, it really, it's uh, agnostic to, to the type of the sensor that we use. So uh, we are trying to test with infrared cameras, with thermal cameras, combine all the information we can. And since we grow things in a very structured environment, we can, we can teach, actually AI can find a lot more information where human eye can't. So we are relying on collecting a lot of data and using this data to build, build algorithm, decision algorithms. But yeah, you, you are absolutely right, NDVI is quite basic, but we can, we can do it with different types of sensors. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, <clears throat> in order to make the transition with the next uh, speakers, do you have uh, also some uh, supervision action uh, foreseen in your experiments? Supervision by humans of the robots, or when you when you say it's fully autonomous, mm -hmm. uh, does you expect to have uh, the human in the loop at a given time, or not at all? Uh, so I try not to not to in these images not to draw humans, but they are really a part of the system. They can't be uh, surveying is one side, but we also want humans to come inside and show the plant what to do. So, for instance, in pollination, we are using the DNPs to. Uh, uh, to actually teach the robot from what a human does how to pollinate a certain flower. So a human is always in the loop, as we can say it, yeah. Okay, thank you very much, thank you again. Uh, <laughs> I can approach. <laughs> and then the next speaker will be Sebastian Putz from Nature Robots, and uh, it will talk about supervision of farms to our long-term autonomous interactive and cooperative monitoring of vegetables in complex micro-farming. Thank you, hi. Yes, um, my name is Sebastian Putz, and we are a team of five or actually six uh, members in our comp company, and uh, we work on like long-term autonomous navigation systems and monitoring in vegetables, uh, vegetable farms, and or in a really complex scenario, also in complex micro-farming, also known as uh, market gardening. And um, yeah, I'm also a senior researcher at the DFKI, the German Research Center of Artificial Intelligence. Um, also one part is based in Osnabrück, so our, our company is also based in Osnabrück. And um, yeah. Our vision is uh, more or less having a couple of robots in long-term autonomous uh, yeah, environments, uh, in farms, um, navigating there and doing their jobs from laser weeding and monitoring the, the plants and, and so on, what you can imagine. And they navigate also in greenhouses, but also outdoors, under trees, around them, and so on. And you could ask, what is market gardening or micro farming? Uh, Exactly that. So you see an image of a market garden with, I guess, 60 beds um, of different vegetables. And these beds are normally 75 centimeters in width and usually 10 meters in length. Um, and there you have 30 to 50 types of different vegetable plants or crops planted next to each other uh, with beneficial effects if you do it right. Um, and we thought, okay, let's let's have this environment in a DFKI exist uh, transfer of research project. So our company is a spin-off of the DFKI in in this project and Plant Map. Plant Map is uh, or stands for a powerful long-term autonomous navigation towards monitoring agricultural plants, um, which is more or less exactly what we do. <laughs> 
Um, and this is an image or a rendering of a 3D mesh. Um, you see their buildings and a uh, fenced uh, robot test environment. Um, and we caught, rec recorded this, um, this data here as 3D high resolution 3D point clouds um, with terrestrial laser scanners uh, and regis registered these um, to each other. Then we removed some outliers and um, yeah, reconstructed this with Poisson uh, surface reconstruction. Um, and these kind of maps we use uh, all the time for navigation. So I, I did my PhD in uh, outdoor navigation using 3D uh, mesh maps um, uh, based on ge geodesic path planning. So we can also navigate in, in forests. Um, later we, you will have a link uh, to your video, uh, but it's not shown today because it's another topic, but you, we can also navigate in forests, uh, avoiding trees and other obstacles. Um, and in the project, we built this robot called Lero, um, an autonomous monitoring robot yeah, for monitoring vegetables in micro farming or other bigger um, uh, vegetable farms. And yeah, we started in um, October 2021 to develop this uh, robot from scratch, so a blank piece of paper. And uh, eight months later, we finished and had it running autonomously in our test environment you saw in, in the previous slides. Um, yeah, we, we did some first tests and yeah, you will see how it goes on in the next slides, but uh, yeah, the maximum plant height is uh, 60 centimeters and we have multiple RGBD cameras and lighters uh, mounted to the robot in a, in a way that we can monitor the plants from different perspectives um, at the same time building 3D mesh maps, uh, 3D map maps of the plants. Um, and how do we do the navigation and, and in a modular way so that we can use it for other robots as well and other farms as well um, with different uh, yeah, plant uh, and bed width and so on. Um, so for that we then develop the Waypoint Navigation uh, software stack, which is also building on top of these mesh maps. And um, of course, always we build on top of ROS. Um, and yeah, we thought, okay, we have a topological Waypoint graph. So nodes are connected um, by edges, and these nodes are always some some points we want to go to in, uh, on the map, and they, the map is also georeferenced, of course, so that we can use uh, uh, RTK if we, if we want. Um, yeah, and then we can here, for example, uh, to make it more mod modular and use it um, with other robots, you, we can uh, select different controllers you will see why this is important for, for example, for our robot. And we can um, block an edge, so this could be then connected to a high-level reasoning system or a high-level planner, um, which then blocks an edge because there's um, yeah, um, something on, on the line or something on the uh, patch and the robot shouldn't go there. So the high-level planner would not uh, use this edge to plan plan along uh, this, its way. Um, yeah, then we can also change the description and the, the types of the edges, so like putting semantic meanings to it um, in different ways. Yeah, this is completely integrated in, in Arvis. Uh, some of you know this, this Arvis is uh, known to the ROS uh, and robotics world as a robot visualization tool. Um, yeah, and then this is integrated with MoveBase Flex. Some of you know maybe MoveBase, which is also pretty known in the ro robotics world. And MoveBase Flex is also an extension I developed in my uh, PhD thesis. It's uh, used worldwide in, in uh, academia, but also in um, uh, yeah, industry, in warehouses uh, quite often. And we developed in Nature Robots uh, the mesh map extension to uh, use it in 
uh, with these mesh maps and not in occupancy grid maps, but in, in mesh maps which are, are suitable for rough terrain and uh, uneven terrain uh, in vineyards, for example. Um, in this way, we can like diff choosing different control controllers is that we can load different controllers at the beginning and then um, with move based legs with a different name. Let's let's say in row and inter row. In row means that we drive over one bed or patch, and inter row means that the robot uses its smaller side to navigate. Um, yeah, in between these rows. We'll see that in a minute. Um, then this state machine here, um, or it's actually a task level uh, state machine, so executing tasks uh, one by another, um, is combining different um, waypoint segments after each other. So meaning that we have diff uh, the same type of edge at the uh, which are connected to each other, then we use the same type of controller. And this is then connected to the low level, uh, meaning move as flex. Um, yeah, here you see this uh, examples where we use it. Uh, on the lower picture, you see, the, you see an image of our robot Lero in the winter time. Um, navigating autonomously. And here you could also see um, how it's navigating in the forest. I, I talked about that be before. There's a, a link, so please take a picture and then uh, use this link to, to see the video for the uh, navigation in the forest um, where, you, where we use the mesh navigation stack um, where it's really beneficial. Um, as I, I said, we want to, or we aim for long-term autonomous systems. Um, therefore, we need a base station. This base station is currently under development, where we also can uh, use our waypoint navigation system in, in a way that we use uh, different edges and waypoints, um, like uh, in the direction of the robot base station, so that we can. Um, yeah, navigate with the robot to the base station and connect or combine these edges um, or assign these edges with some controllers in a way that the uh, um, robot docks to a docking station or um, drives into the container, drives out of the container. So we can then really easily uh, adapt the navigation uh, strategy we use at, at the current moment or at the current edge in a waypoint graph. So we did this um, for last year for completely autonomous navigation in our environment there for one and a half months. Um, recorded data of all bets uh, more than twice a week. Um, and one run is shown now. So what we see this environment here, um, I, I said uh, we are localizing the robot with GPS or RTK. So in this scenario, the robot is completely, let's say, uh, navigating um, blind. It's just ignoring obstacles. So it's just using the global position uh, system, or, uh, the RTK system. But it's also possible that we can use the 3D mesh map with the light on top, you see, um, to do LIDAR localization in the 3D map. So we did that also, so that it's not uh, necessary that we rely on RTK with the same precision. And the orientation is, uh, here, it's also solved by an IMU. Um, we here also use normal uh, odometry uh, fused with an extended Kalman filter um, yeah, to make the navigation system better. Here you see yeah, the robot is driving over the, these patches or beds um, and uh, recording data from 
different perspectives, like from the top, from the left, and from the right with RGB cameras. And yeah, we did that here for all beds, and later the robot will also um, drive over curved beds. But let's, let's go on here. Um, so after we recorded these data, we get 3D, colored 3D point clouds um, from plants. Like, uh, for example, here, bad root and red cabbage, and so on. Um, these, yeah. 3D um, frames from the, the uh, three cameras are aligned to each other while the robot is drives. Looks like that. And then we get a consistent um, map of one bed with plants. So right now it's just a blob of information, <laughs> just a blob of point cloud, uh, just a blob of points just a colored point cloud, so there's no information on uh, what we see here as a human, so that we actually see some instances, uh, namely plants. So what we need is uh, yeah, some instance segmentation. We did this with an adapted version of um, RCNN, so we uh, call it Flex RCNN. It's a Flex because we can add and delete easily some classes uh, and not need to uh, retrain the whole network, um, which is based on a C um, backbone network, uh, taking the colored image into account, the depth image, but also the infra, uh, near infrared image. All these inform information then, then are fused in the backbone and then we have a classification network on top um, resulting in pixel precise um, yeah, polygons, or let's say uh, masks, telling us how, what we see. Uh, online it looks like that. So you, you saw at the beginning there's an Aruku marker uh, that the robot knows which um, bat it is scanning at the moment. But we all also know this because these, uh, this information is attached to the edge at the waypoint navigation server. Um, combining this information with the 3D images then gives us 3D instances of plants. So this looks like that in, in, in a video because 3D in, as an image is always a bit boring, <laughs> let's say, like that. Um, so we have plant instances here colored with different colors, um, and then also using spectral indices. Um, just We just started with that. Uh, and we'll go on with further analysis here. Then extracting some leaf spots, but it's also just at, at the beginning here. Yeah, um, thank you, and join us at our booth uh, when you enter the, the tent directly to the right. Uh, please ask questions uh, now and later when you see us. Thank you so much. Uh, is there any question in the audience? Please don't be shy. Do not hesitate to raise a hand. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Very interesting. And um, I have an observation more than a question. Um, the context is market gardening, basically. And this uh, robot appears a bit uh, a disruptive technology in this uh, sector because normally market gardening is um, performed using uh, little tools. So do you think that it can be easily accepted by market gardeners? Short answer, no. <laughs> but um, that's a good question. So let me, let me 
uh, go on that a bit, or stress this question a bit. So we, we use this environment because it's quite hard. Uh, we have really tightly packed plants next to each other, so we have much more, um, yeah, it's much more challenging to train a network and to label data for these environments than you have on a normal field where the plants are a bit, uh, yeah, not not that close to each other. And we have, uh, yeah, we, we also, um, with our team, we want to build technologies for regenerative agriculture, uh, yeah, in, in terms of climate change and so on. But we use this environment as a training environment because it's quite hard. And later, um, and also currently, we're um, adapting these technologies to larger scale um, normal vegetable farms because they <laughs> can, can maybe um, use such a robot and also finance such a, such a robot in, in any uh, way you can think of. Yeah. company. Um, I just wanted to ask, what do you plan to do with the data? So you're talking about regenerative farming and you've obviously got the mapping of the plants in the field. What do you plan to do with the data on the, um, with the, of the plants? Um, I think you, you, you're talking about the 3D data and the, where each plant is. Um, so what we have there is the semantic environment representation and then we know each plant on the, on the field, exactly the position like in a centimeter uh, resolution, and we, if we do that from from every like do that every day, uh, from day to day, then we can measure growth, uh, we can um, predict the harvest point, um, yeah, we can like um, derive um, decision support systems from out of that, like giving. Uh, decisions or supporting decisions of the farmers in a way, but also think of may maybe breeders. Um, they are probably uh, also interested in what the, their plants are look look like in, in a more abstract way, but not not seeing the, the 3D images, but more in a yeah analytical way. So this is what we are planning to do. Maybe a last quick question. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, two questions actually. I hope I can, can do it in one. Uh, so, so you also told that you are making time series. So, so from time, from moment to moment, you 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 image the whole season. So, what are you doing with the time series? So that that's one question. And also, if you are doing regenerative agriculture, which I very much like, and I think there is a huge business for it, also for also for, price, for the prices of such a robot, because I do not have the time, but I could have the money. Yeah? So, um, so, so what, what, what are you doing also to embrace biodiversity, for example? I, what, how, you do, how, you do, how do you deal with weeds, and how do you value them, and what are you doing in your project? What are your plans for that? So time series, yes. and how do you embrace biodiversity in your setup? Yes. Um, with a time series, we just started, so our company is just one, one year old, I would say. Um, we, as I said, we currently develop a semantic environment representation where we track um, yeah, the 3D information of the plant of each day. So we have an instance of each plant. And then we track the semantics So what we see, what, what is it, <laughs> what type of plant is it. And or what, yeah, what type of object is it? And then we uh, track the temporal instance. So when we saw this uh, 3D information, and yeah, collecting data then for for a week or a month, then we can analyze this on 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 the differences or uh, look at one instance at a at a certain uh, patch or one plant instance and. Yeah, um, combine the shape of the of the plant. Yeah, and then the second question um, regarding regenerative agriculture. Um, this is more like um, 
an objective of us, uh, a goal, <laughs> what's, what's, what, is, what drives us. Um, and there we have another topic beside market gardening, which is agroforestry, um, where we see some strengths with our technology in a way that we do these 3D um, mesh maps and the 3D navigation that we can, um, as I said, we use LiDAR technologies to, uh, a, a, a 3D LiDAR uh, localization technologies to localize in this mesh map uh, so that it's possible to drive without GPS um, what we probably have where uh, if we have a lot of trees um, and so on. So this is uh, what we also plan to do. Perfect. We uh, don't have time to go further on the question. Thank, so you. thank you again. <laughs> and now we welcome Matteo Matteucci, right, uh, from uh, Politecnico di Milano. And uh, Matteo will uh, talk about uh, uh, agro projects and agro challenge in the framework of agrobofood. And just after, we're going to have a presentation on the agrobofood project. So welcome and please go away. Thank you. Just a <clears throat> okay, just just to be sure, I don't speak too much. So, so welcome everyone. Um, as you can see from the slide, this is a, a project uh, that uh, is funded by the European Commission. Uh, the overall project is called Metrics, and it has the aim to develop some competitions for uh, evaluating the performance of robots. And here today I'm talking about one of these competitions, uh, which is called uh, ACR. And it's a, a, a way to measure the capability of uh, uh, intelligence and autonomous robot in the task of weeding. Uh, this work is presented by me, but is co-authored by Manon Boulet and Daniel Boffetti from INRAE, uh, Riccardo and Giulio Fontana from Politecnico, and Davide Facchinetti from the University of Milan. So, uh, weeding and uh, intelligence robots in farming. So, uh, you all know that uh, at the European level there has been a big stress on improving uh, the techniques and the technologies uh, in the farming uh, with the long-term mission of a better uh, soil and health food. In particular, the European Commission has set some target goals for 2030, which has at the same time challenges and demanding for the uh, robotic community and from the scientific community. And, uh, the European Commission is not the only one uh, pushing toward an improvement, uh, step change in technology. I mean, if uh, we read the recent uh, 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 FAO document on Agriculture 4.0, uh, they have done a very nice and neat uh, uh, analysis on how robotics and new technologies like AI or IoT uh, could comply with the change that we are observing in farms from uh, small scale farms and to small farms. And uh, uh, that's very interesting because the previous uh, uh, talk have already talked about this idea of smart farms and how to integrate AI and robotics in these smart farms. Um, so why we think, well, there has been analysis also from a market perspective uh, on the uh, increase of this uh, sector. Uh, this is just one of the reports that I was able to find, but there are several reports that have uh, observed how there is a, a growing interest also from an economic perspective in weeding robot and in the market of robot for weeding. And if you look around here at FIRA as well, uh, there are several of these robots uh, demoing tomorrow. So uh, that uh, shows that uh, it is the right time to uh, start making some sort of uh, assessment on the performances 
of these uh, uh, robots when performing the weeding task. And uh, the goal of this uh, uh, agri-food campaign for robot evaluation uh, done within the metrics project is to devise a way to perform uh, some assessment at a different level uh, of these robots uh, for weeding. Uh, this uh, campaign is organized by four institutions. One is the Politecnico di Milano, second one, LE, uh, uh, then the INRAE, and we have uh, Università degli Studi di Milano. I'm not pronouncing French names. Um, please <laughs> don't ask me to do that. <laughs> So um, the idea of this um, uh, campaign for robot evaluation is to uh, evaluate the performance of robot uh, in uh, reducing the use of pesticides and the use of chemical products in general when performing weeding. Uh, and uh, we know that the basic element is to be able to detect weeds and distinguish weeds from plants. Uh, and the other element is uh, to somehow intervene in the removal of these weeds. Uh, and it's nice that today I'm the last one speaking about uh, during this workshop because the first one speaking this morning was exactly telling about uh, the project that you see on the bottom line of this slide. So everything started with the Rose Challenge. The Rose Challenge uh, in France uh, suggested uh, to face the problem of uh, intra, we uh, intra row weeding. And during that challenge, uh, uh, four teams for, um, from the French uh, industry and research labs, they uh, faced with different tools, going from mechanical weeding to um, <coughs> electrical weeding, this problem. The project was so uh, successful that the European Commission uh, decided there was uh, interesting enough to enlarge uh, this uh, activity at the European level. So uh, if the uh, Rose Challenge was uh, limited to four French teams, now what we did was to design a competition, a challenge, I would say, uh, open to uh, all European teams and, I mean, teams from abroad as well. Um, so the project started uh, in 2000. Uh, uh, the beginning of 2020, uh, 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 then we had um, uh, <clears throat> a little delay because uh, uh, something called COVID that spread immediately at the beginning of the project, but uh, then we recovered and uh, we had two dry run campaign and we uh, have two field campaigns plus three cascade campaigns. I'm going to explain what these terms mean. So field campaigns are uh, field campaigns, as the name says, where robots meet in a physically open to the public uh, uh, demo area and they uh, face the task that we are presenting them. Uh, cascade campaign are more uh, data-oriented campaign. I say that uh, one uh, characteristic that is common to all these systems is related to AI and the capability of distinguishing uh, crop from weeds. Uh, and this, luckily, uh, does not really need uh, to go in a place and test your algorithm. This can be done with uh, uh, images and data collected from the field. So the, the program of Cascade Campaign is to run this competition online with the data collected during the physical campaign. Um, we are here, uh, almost at the end of the project. Don't worry, there is already a follow-up project uh, coming out, so this uh, experience will continue for the next year. Uh, and uh, there will be a physical campaign in May in Italy uh, where you all I are invited, especially if you have a, a weeding robot. Um, the first campaign was held in Montaudre in France uh, with the two main crops, uh, green beans and maize, and different kinds of weeds. Uh, the next campaign, as I said, will be in Italy, in uh, Cornaredo. Uh, you might w wonder where is uh, Cornaredo. Well, Cornaredo is uh, here. Uh, let's see if I manage to find the light. So here is Cornaredo next to Milan, Milano, and nearby my house, by the way. So 
very convenient, at least for me, it's very convenient, but uh, it's very easy to reach uh, Milan as well. And uh, the plan is to uh, keep the same crops, maize and beans, and add maybe some salad or zucchini to uh, increase the number of production uh, that uh, we would like to face with our uh, weeding robots. Um, what are the tasks that uh, this robot will have the opportunity to perform? Uh, they are related to the classical uh, robotics task. Uh, one is perception, uh, which in this case is uh, cast in the perception of plant and weeds, so to discriminate which are the plants that have to be destroyed and the one that have to be uh, saved. And uh, some tasks they also aim at uh, uh, the estimation of leaf area and biomass. So this is another task that we will organize for the participant to the event. Uh, then we have uh, a task related to autonomy, where the robot have to move autonomously along the crop lines uh, in the field, and uh, they might perform some monitoring task. We have seen an example in the previous talk with a robot uh, building a map of the crop, and we would like to do the same in this case, but in this case we will measure the position and we will compare the accuracy of the mapping procedure. And finally, the task of, uh, uh, let's say, actuation in robot, which in this case is with destruction. So robot will have to uh, destroy the weeds that will have uh, placed uh, intentionally on the crop. Uh, you might wonder what are those uh, yellow and blue disks. Um, what we would like to do uh, with uh, LNE and INRA is to measure uh, the accuracy of each robot functionality. And in that case, uh, we will like to measure only the accuracy in the destruction part not in the perception. So we will tell the robot which are the uh, crop to preserve and which are the weed to remove. And this will allow us to measure how good is the manipulation capability or the actuation capability of the robot. Um, all these tasks are described in a document that you will find in the a website of the project. I will give you the link at the end of my presentation, so there will be a nice QR code. You can take a picture of it at the end. So as I said here, some of the tasks. Uh, one is uh, the plant weed discrimination. The goal is to detect which plant uh, has to be uh, removed and which has to be kept. Uh, in this case, we are interested in evaluation the accuracy of the perception system of the robot. Uh, here are some example of the expected outcome. Um, we will come back to these images. The image on the right hand side has been manually annotated. So we will have a robot performing this, uh, visual, uh, this perception task and we will measure against the human annotators to decide how good is the algorithm in this case. Uh, this I already talked, which is the width destruction. Again, we would like to measure how good robots are in uh, uh, destroying weeds, preserving uh, plants, and in this case, we will tell the robot uh, where is the weed to destroy and the plant to uh, preserve. And uh, finally, we have the robot navigation. Uh, you have seen an example of this already in the talk of this morning, if you were here. Uh, we will have uh, standard uh, single line straight navigation, but also will require the robot to turn and to follow a line, uh, which is not uh, necessary a line here. Uh, how can we measure how good uh, is the performance in the robot? You see here we have um, a laser tracker, so we will track the position of the robot uh, during the movement. Um, an example uh, of uh, this uh, uh, tracking performance uh, is here. This, was, uh, uh, this is data collected uh, during the last year event in Montaldre. So you see that uh, uh, most of the robots are quite accurate in following the track, even when the track is not straight at all. Um, this is an example uh, coming from the first dry run trial uh, two years ago when we were uh, 
designing this task and we were uh, making sure that uh, at least it was doable by some robot uh, at the end of the day. So um, I told you that uh, beside the physical event, uh, we have a digital event. Um, we collect the data from uh, our robots and from robots that participate to the event. We uh, manually label this data and uh, we uh, ask uh, whoever wants to participate to test their algorithm on this data. When the first dry run, we call it dry round because I mean uh, we uh, tested mostly uh, among us because uh, we were not sure everything was okay, was run in 2020 uh, and uh, it was based on the ROS data set. Uh, then there was a second, uh, let's say, campaign online in February 2022. Uh, it was based again on the uh, ROS data set. Uh, in this case, we had multiple years uh, from the same uh, robot and census on obviously different crops. And this year, uh, this uh, online competition will start uh, this month. Uh, will be published and uh, uh, you can participate. What is the interesting part is that you can uh, already get some pictures of the crops as they will look like uh, during the physical campaign. So you can somehow have an idea of the crops you will face uh, when coming to uh, Milan. These images uh, have been taken last year during the competition in Montolge. Um, how do we run the campaign? Well, the classical uh, online competition, we set up a website. Uh, this is uh, <coughs> Codalab, is uh, an open platform. You register on the platform, uh, you download the data, and uh, you have, uh, let's say, one month, two months to perform uh, the task online. How do you, you get evaluated? You send us the model and we run your model on uh, some hidden data and then we will tell you uh, how much is your score. And we also have some rank. Uh, this is an example of uh, the dry run. You can see here uh, single student university companies and uh, quite 35% uh, of people that didn't want to tell us who they were. I mean, fair enough. <laughs> That's, um, there was also Sony uh, Computing Lab. Uh, they had a project uh, funded by the European Commission as part of the project. They were really active in participating to the Acre Challenge. Um, how does it work? Well, usually you get uh, some data at the beginning of the competition, so you can start training your model. Uh, and then you have uh, some uh, uh, new data to fine tune your model and then submit uh, the last model that you have designed. We will evaluate uh, the very last model on this. Um, what are the challenges that uh, could happen? Well, so far we have always uh, been nice uh, with the participant of the online competition and this year will be the same. But uh, in the near future, what we would like to do is to uh, have this uh, online competition grow and see uh, different data. So here, you might have seen this data this morning uh, uh, on the second talk. Uh, when you have a different robot and different camera and a different uh, field, you might have uh, severe changes in the images. And so what we would like to do is the long term is to try to collect uh, uh, evaluations of different systems on different crops. Uh, and to do this, we are running this physical event. We are collecting images from uh, real robots with their own visual system. And then in that case, we will be able to understand how robust is a perception algorithm with respect to uh, lighting changes, color, temperature, focal length uh, of the vision system, and other characteristic of the uh, robot or the perception system. Okay, um, so I'm getting close to the end, so a couple of minutes more, even less. So how could be involved in this competition? Well, as a team, so we welcome you to participate. 
um, stop with me. I will be here today and tomorrow if you want to know more about this uh, event. We really want to structure this as an event. Our uh, interest is not to state uh, who's better or who's worst. Our intent is to understand what is the state of the art now nowadays. So you can even come do the test and uh, uh, keep your score for yourself because uh, that's not uh, the main goal. Um, if you show your score, we will give prize, so you might win. That's uh, another uh, point you might be interested in. Um, if you want to sponsor this event somehow, well, why not? We, I mean, we appreciate. Thank you. Uh, and um, if you want uh, us to work with your data as well, uh, our goal, as I said, especially for the online competition, is to enlarge the base. Um, or, uh, well, I have some flyers for you for more information. The last uh, uh, slide that I would like to show, then I will uh, conclude my talk, is that we have already some activities uh, planned. Uh, one is uh, an online workshop. Uh, if you want to know more about the competition, check on the Metrics website. It's uh, on the 23 of February, 23. Yes, and uh, we will uh, present the competition in detail and you will have uh, uh, all the time to talk with us and ask questions. The competition will be at the end of May in Italy, coordinator. Uh, Cornaredo, please come and join us. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, do not hesitate. We can take a very quick question while people taking the flash code. Quick question, yes. Yes, I think that weeding is much more than only distinguished between target plants and, uh, and weeds. It's also about managing the competition and there are also beneficial weeds. At the end, it's uh, the crop yield which is important because of the weeding. So also the whole soil life, how deep you weed, has a huge influence on, on, uh, yeah, on uh, the, the, yeah, the, the crop value. How is the crop value incorporated in this weeding challenge? Yes, I was not uh, intentionally very uh, pushy on uh, you will win, you will lose, because uh, what we will do, we'll, we'll evaluate um, uh, the long-term effect of the weeding. So we will not look... Uh, uh, the day of the competition, what is the result? Uh, we will see after 15 days what happens to the weed because they might just appear at the crops uh, return. So that's why I'm saying, and the day after you will know who's the winner? No, uh, this is more an evaluation campaign. So uh, after a week or 15 days and at the end when the crop is finished, we will do exactly because of what you say. Thank you for your question that gave me the opportunity to clarify. Thank you very much. Thank to you. Thank you, Gay. <laughs> and we have a last uh, speaker on this session, who is uh, Farzam uh, Rasbaram. Sorry for my bad uh, English, because we heard a lot about uh, Agrobo Food Project, and so Farzam uh, will uh, take a picture of uh, this project. And it will also uh, be the beginning of the introduction of the discussion we have just after. How much time? between 10 and 20. Um, yes, good afternoon. Um, my name is Farzam Ranjbaran. Uh, you've heard already the, the, the name Agrobo Food a uh, few times today, and the idea is for me to give you a little bit of the flavor of this project. Um, um, I work for CEA uh, in uh, near Paris, the French National uh, Commission for Alternative and Atomic Energies, uh, it's been about two and a half years I'm with CEA and therefore <clears throat> had the pleasure of working with uh, Agrobo Food Network. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here, but also uh, I was asked to replace uh, Case Loghorst, who is the coordinator of uh, Agrobo Food and who was, according to the program, who was supposed to be here to give the talk. My version would be a modest version of what Case could have done, of course, much more uh, widely but it gives you some flavors of the program anyway. So AgroboFood is a network 
of diverse inter international partners. It's a European project funded under Horizon 2020 uh, funding programs of the European Commission, DG Connect. And these organizations uh, go from RTOs, research technology organizations such as CEA and others, to associations, SEMA and SMEs and larger industries, INRAE. Uh, <clears throat> and by design, Agrobo Food has been uh, clustered into regional clusters. And um, the coordinator of the regional clusters is Eric, who will be taking part in the panel discussions later on. Um, and uh, CEA is the technical, is the lead for the French Italy regional cluster. And uh, if you want to ask why this clustering in such a way, it would be great uh, to discuss that uh, later during the booth or during the panel discussions. Agrobo Food has a booth, by the way, number three, where Eric, myself, and uh, another colleague from Wacheningen, Natalie Hartram, will be around to meet you, to discuss with you if you like to pass. Um, and the idea has been to create uh, synergy between these uh, digital innovation hubs, in the terminology of the European Commission, and competence centers uh, to promote adoption of robotics in agri-food sector. Um, the project has gone through basically three main building blocks. The first one has been uh, the creation of the networks, the DIHs and the competence centers, um, then to creating these other types of projects, which are the smaller cascade funding projects, and to come to demonstrations. And I will say a little bit more about that later on, uh, but first let's have a look at the evolution of the network. The idea of Agropo Food has been that this initial cluster of digital innovation hubs and competence centers are running the network, are creating the collaborative links and the framework to provide this service to the ecosystems, basically the SMEs and larger industries. So therefore they have opened up the membership and the SMEs and other entities in the ecosystem were invited to join Agrobo Food and the, the network grew uh, based on these invitations. And you, you see all the regional clusters here. And of course, uh, our regional cluster did not grow as uh, good as the Northwest uh, regional cluster did, being the coordinators and being um, more uh, directly involved also, again, being more directly involved in the thematic of agriculture than CEA List Institute, where I work. So basically, in the catalog of services and competencies that Agrobo Food uh, clustered together, um, in terms of the main uh, agri-food sector, there are these, uh, uh, these sectors. And um, what is shown here is basically, uh, in terms of the, num the members in the network, which one of these clusters uh, they are more pertinent or they, they relate to. Um, also, we had similar uh, distribution of the competencies that each of the members of the network could bring when it comes to the robotics uh, competencies. So this presentation will be a very, very quick, uh, just flavor of AgriboFood. If you need more information, we can provide it to you. The initial budget of AgriboFood was uh, 16 million euro. Half of it was meant to do the networking, to create the, the, the ecosystem and half of it was to be redistributed through this cascade funding instrument to SMEs. Uh, this has uh, been done. In addition, um, there has been also events uh, that Eric had really pushed for, and that was a pitch your robot event in uh, meet your investors. So companies coming, pitching for their solutions and investors being present to continue. He has uh, more to say on that, I am sure, because there is a new one coming up very soon with a deadline of 3rd of March. Um, so the open calls uh, that were used to distribute the, six, the 8 million euros were open calls with a committee that will receive the proposals, will evaluate based on given criteria, and 
the money would be distributed from these member, uh, these DIHs, such as ours. We were then assigned as mentors uh, or evaluators, and then we would be living with these projects as they go as they went through their lives. So there were. Um, three open calls, uh, first one six projects, the second one nine projects, five, uh, the last one five projects, and these were out of phase one from the other. But uh, all three groups had uh, basically three main steps in their life cycle. The first one was design, second was, one was develop, the third one was um, demonstrate or market, and uh, for many of them now we are uh, going into that. Um, so some numbers about the average uh, prices that were given. For example, in one of the calls, uh, about 25 SMEs were, fu um, were funded uh, for six projects in this case, and an average of 445,000. So um, not a very negligible opportunity for some of the SMEs. One of the calls was constructed on challenges and these five challenges were defined, and the proposals were invited to respond to these challenges in their, in their applications. And um, I will not go through all of these. Uh, I just say a few words about some of these projects that happen to be in the, within the France-Italy regional cluster, because this presentation was made in, on one of our regional cluster meetings. And, um, that, um, for example, in one of the last call, uh, the project uh, Mirage is a very small uh, SME uh, family of farmers. They have big potato fields in north of France near Lille, but they are engineers. They are really, really young, dynamic engineers, and they wanted to have a robot that does smart uh, irrigation. So they built, actually, a, a robotic system, a platform, which carries this very huge, very heavy uh, t tube of uh, watering, which are high pressure, and they, they need really high forces and high maneuverability. Their plan is to generate electricity on board using the pressure in the tube. Their plan is to use earth-penetrating radar to measure humidity in the soil, augment that with, uh, material, uh, with climate uh, information that they get online, put all of that through AI and machine learning, therefore to be able to do smart irrigation. This is one example. Another example I catch is not in um, our region, is in Eric's uh, regional cluster, and this I really find it magnificent. They have designed a palm-sized uh, drone, extremely agile, whose job is to make a rendezvous with moth in tutti, fruity moth indoor in the, ser in the um, greenhouse of uh, tomato plants to go make a rendezvous and eliminate uh, the moth uh, midair. And they have videos on uh, YouTube channels and it's extremely interesting. And now they're coming to the phase of uh, finding their market. Um, so I think um, I mentioned a little bit what I wanted to say about these projects uh, and their sizes. I think if the presentations will be made available, if you're interested, you can have look at them and go find more information. Um, and yes, on the third uh, event that uh, Agrobo Food is organizing on pit, meet your investor, pitch your robot, I think Eric will say more in the panel discussions, I'm pretty sure. And uh, that's all for Agrobo Food for now. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, we won't take a question for Farzam uh, because uh, we will have uh, Eric uh, to discuss about Agrobo Food project during the discussion the panel discussion. I would like to thank again uh, Farzam uh, because I asked him to uh, prepare a short presentation very, very <laughs> a few ago.